Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to the second webinar of the MAP Program's 2016-2017 webinar series. My name is Heather Archimel and I'm a program manager in the MAP Program. And our webinar today is co-sponsored by NOAA Fisheries. And I want to thank Roger Griffiths uh, for his help in putting together this webinar. Today we'll hear presentations on the topic of unified modeling for marine applications from three excellent researchers. Before I introduce our first speaker, I want to first let you know that this webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it on our MAP webinar webpage along with the PDFs of the presentations. And we'd like to encourage you to participate. Um, we should have plenty of time for questions and answers after each presentation and uh, potentially some additional time at the end uh, for more general discussion on the topic of unified modeling. Um, all phone lines will be muted during the presentation, but if you'd like to ask a question at any point during the webinar, uh, please use the raise hand feature in WebEx. And to access this feature, uh, you can hover your cursor over the tab at the top center of your screen and then click the participants button followed by the raise hand logo. And at that point, a hand icon will appear next to your name in the attendee list. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I can then unmute your phone and you can ask the question. Or alternatively, you can submit your question at any time in the chat box. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, now introduce our first speaker, Dr. Charles Stock. Charles is a research oceanographer at uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, he's working to understand and predict interactions between marine ecosystems and climate on timescales ranging from seasons to multiple decades. He carries out this work through the innovative application of DFDL's models to assess the impact of climate on marine ecosystems, as well as the development of next generation marine ecosystem models for DFDL's Earth system models. Uh, Charles, are you there? It would help if I unmuted you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So you should be able to share your screen now. All right. Hey, and take it away whenever you're ready. It looks like your presentation is coming up. Great. So can everyone see the um, uh, Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Okay. And if I move if my I cursor, cursor, can you see the uh, arrow? Uh, can you try doing that? Uh, yep, it looks okay. yep, that works okay. great. Thanks. Um, so thanks uh, for having me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Earth System Predictions for Marine Resource Management Across Space and Time Scales. And just noting that while I'm presenting the work, uh, it really reflects the contributions of many uh, people who I'll mention uh, throughout the talk. Uh, so marine resource management decisions have to be made across a wide range of space and time scales. In a recent paper uh, led by Desiree Tomasi, uh, she summarized this on a space-time axis. Uh, the the x-axis on this plot here is, is time scales from days to centuries and space up from very local 10-kilometer scales up to planetary scales. And you can see decisions about industry operations, monitoring enclosures, annual catch limits, rebuilding plans and protected areas, industry and long-term resource capitalization, and finally resilience and sustainability need to be made across those time scales. And with resilience and sustainability, I'll note that while Desiree has put this on, on very uh, long time and space scales, really there's a need to connect these questions across um, spatial scales down to the local scale. And a lot of the, the, my talk today is based on the hope that if we can anticipate climate-driven ecosystem changes across those scales, we can make better decisions about how to manage resources uh, within them. Uh, and I'll talk a lot about how we're trying to combine existing uh, tools, modeling tools, and, and um, also make progress in sort of new frontiers in order to fill this kind of challenging space of environmental prediction. Um, the backbone for, for most of this work is uh, a global climate model. Um, this is not always sufficient to answer all the questions that we need to answer, as I'll talk about, but it's often the, uh, the starting point, and I think in Kirsten's and, and Isaac's talk, you'll, you'll hear that as a common theme. And the GCM uh, is depicted here in the middle as sort of a, a gridded depiction of the ocean, the atmosphere, the land, and sea ice system. Uh, and when you run this uh, global climate model in, in different configurations, you can actually provide 
uh, predictions and projections across a full range of, of uh, temporal scales from seasons to centuries. And that's what's depicted here in this plot. On the top of the plot depicts the running of a model like this in a seasonal prediction mode. In this case, the real trick is to try and initialize the climate system as closely as possible to the actual present state and hope that that has enough memory and predictable interactions to give you climate prediction skill out for months to even uh, several years. On the bottom of the plot, we have um, a run in a climate change context where the goal here is to, to gradually track the evolution of the climate system as a response to greenhouse gas forcing over multiple decades uh, to centuries. And so there the initial condition isn't really that important, but you want to specify uh, these climate forcings, greenhouse gases and aerosols, and hope that the model can accurately predict the evolution over those long time scales that were relevant to the resilience and um, uh, sustainability questions. The cable predictions sit uh, in the middle of these two and combine elements of both the initial value problem of seasonal prediction and the boundary value problem of uh, 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 century scale climate projections. Um, because we're focusing on marine ecosystem applications here, I'd like to introduce uh, an Earth system model, which is what we get when we expand a physical climate model to include Earth system elements. Uh, a physical climate model consists of four basic components. You have an ocean circulation model, land physics and hydrology, sea ice and atmospheric circulation and radiation. The Earth system components add these green parts, ocean ecology and biogeochemistry, plant ecology and land use, and interactive CO2. The initial motivation for these models uh, from a climate perspective was that we wanted a model that you could force with the emissions of CO2 rather than specifying it in the atmosphere and let the model determine how much of that CO2 ends up in the ocean, how much ends up on land, and how much ends up in the atmosphere where it can contribute to greenhouse warming. In the process, however, we introduced this ocean ecology and biogeochemistry piece which allows us to, uh, in a much more meaningful way, uh, investigate the impacts of climate on uh, marine resources. Some of the first things these models told us were general magnitudes and directions of trends and, and potential ecosystem stressors. And this was summarized in a paper by Laurent Bopp and colleagues in 2013, where they looked at uh, changes in ocean temperatures across different ESMs contributed to CMIP-5, uh, where you see increases of three or four degrees under a high emission scenario. Um, this plot on the right, uh, right here shows the decline in pH of about 0.3 units. Um, over here you have oxygen declining in, in response to changes in ocean stratification. And of course, ocean productivity tends to either stay stable or exhibit modest declines as one moves forward. So these, um, these global perspectives, I think, have shaped the way we think about how we need to understand how organisms respond to climate change. The pH range shapes the experiments we undertake to understand how shellfish respond to acidification, for example. Um, and I think we've all become sort of uh, the, the, the general magnitude of these quantities and their changes have become ingrained in our minds. For instance, people will often tell me, well, ocean productivity will only change probably by about uh, 0 to 10 percent. Uh, but another thing that these models have taught us is that underlying these global mean values is a very rich pattern of spatial heterogeneous uh, trends. And if you take any one of these models and look at a quantity such as the percentage of net primary productivity change over the next century under a high emission scenario, you see a general global value, which in this case was about 3.6 percent in GFDL's ESM2M with a cobalt ecosystem model. And underlying this mean trend is uh, a really intense spatial heterogeneity where despite relatively modest global mean values, there are regions here which uh, undergo 10 to 20 percent changes or over 25 percent. Furthermore, as we add um, ecological realism to these models, they've been very uh, persistently suggesting that the regional changes will become amplified at higher trophic levels. And here I've shown the percent change in mesozooplankton productivity, which are essentially fish food, um, uh, the primary food item for the larval stages of many fish and the primary food item for the adult stages of forage fish. And you see those 
25% changes at regional scale often become 50% changes at regional scale. So we're talking factors of two and changing uh, baselines in these cases. Of course, uh, uh, zooplankton are great, but what we're really interested in is uh, what are the potential implications for changes in fisheries catch as we move forward in time. Uh, for this study, we were able to leverage a, um, a prototype one-tenth of a degree global Earth system model that we could run for about 50 years and use it to study uh, the relationship between plankton productivity like those mesozooplankton I showed and fisheries catch as provided by a new sea around us database on different large marine ecosystems, which are these coastal areas that are shown in this plot on the, uh, the left-hand side. And to make a long story short, what we find is that catch is much more closely related to those higher trophic level properties, mesozooplankton productivity, export flux, than it is to net primary production. Um, and this is a, a relationship with net primary production here. You see a, uh, a relatively weak relationship. The correlation is above 0.47. And this is a model that relates, a trophodynamic model that relates the fish catch across systems to those higher trophic level trophodynamic processes. Um, as a result, when we try and project potential changes in fish catch forward in time, we see that the, the magnitude of the percent change, projected percent change in catch is similar to those mesozooplankton values. Rather than getting changes that are order of you know, 10 to 20 percent as a maximum for regional change, we get values that can approach 50 percent in some regions. Um, so a key overarching result from, from this line of work in, in moving our system models from global trends into regional patterns is that climate change may produce regional changes in marine ecosystem, ecosystems that greatly exceed the offsided global mean patterns. Uh, I think this fact is already shaping uh, our attempts to develop climate resilient management strategies, but if we want to move beyond simply including climate buffers, uh, safety buffers, we really need to to do better and really try and, and quantitatively constrain regional changes in fish yields and ocean productivity in a better way than we have. This is a hard problem and there are many reasons why it's a hard problem. I've listed three of them there, stubborn regional biases and global climate models. Uh, it's hard to get detailed regions right when you're also modeling the, the entire globe. Uh, the impacts of unresolved local scale processes that aren't resolved by these GCMs, which often have resolutions of around one degree and uncertainties in ecosystem responses to climate drivers. Uh, I'm going to switch gears for a moment and talk to you about some of the ways we're trying to, to whittle away at these limitations, starting with this impacts of unresolved local scale processes. Each of those regional patterns of change that I showed on the previous plots often has a very detailed underlying set of mechanisms that drive it. And you can actually use even a coarse resolution Earth system model to understand those mechanisms. Uh, this is a nice example that was led by Ryan Rikicheski uh, together with John Dunn here at GFDL. Uh, Ryan noted that in the California current system, which is shown in this box here, um, the nitrogen in the system was projected to increase with climate change. And this is, if you, if you read across the top of this plot, this is the 1860 nitrate concentration, the end of the, the next century nitrate concentration under a high emission scenario and the difference. And you see, in general, the surface nitrate decreases across the whole North Pacific Basin, but it increased um, in the California current system. And if you track the nitrate in that control volume, you see it increasing here on the bottom. Ryan was able to isolate the driver of that as being a systematic increase in the age of the source waters that were being upwelled in the California current system. Essentially, uh, with the stratification developing over the North Pacific Basin, Waters were subducted further away, traveled further across the North Pacific Basin before upwelling in the California current, and along the way obtained more nitrate and lost more oxygen. So there was this dynamical biogeochemical shift that was causing this increase in uh, nitrate and productivity in the California current. But the model was too coarse to really understand all the regional implications of this pattern. So approach we took was uh, a downscaling approach, and I think uh, you'll hear more about these sort of approaches from Isaac and Kirsten, where we apply this biogeochemical forcing to a high-resolution regional uh, simulation, which actually had the same biogeochemical dynamics within it. We've, we've implemented the GFDL uh, biogeochemistry into a ROMS regional model here, 
And that model can actually, for the first time, capture chlorophyll values that range from 0.1 in the oligotrophic limit of the offshore boundary, all the way up to 10 to 20 milligrams of chlorophyll in the core of this upwelling system here. And what Ralph Dusen has, uh, has implemented, uh, uh, scientists at Rutgers, is some simple perturbations which says, okay, well, what is the effect of these biogeochemical perturbations that we might expect? And so he perturbed the nitrogen and the oxygen together. He perturbed just the nitrogen and uh, uh, um, perturbed just the oxygen. And what you find was the hypoxic volume on the California current under the control scenario is this black line here. But when you uh, perturb both the oxygen and the nitrogen together, the hypoxic volume increased to this red line here. Most of that increase was due to the direct effect of decreasing oxygen in the source waters, which is this blue line, but it was augmented by, uh, by the added effect of increasing the nitrate in the system, which increased the productivity and also tended to decrease the oxygen. So that's one example of trying to connect those scales. Another one is one that's underway as part of a CPO COCA project where we're looking at the potential impacts of similar dynamic uh, physical and biogeochemical shifts along shelf boundaries on the ability to affect the productivity of the Northeast U.S. shelf ecosystem. A uh, recent paper by, led by Vince Saba really highlighted the potential for the source waters that, that enter the, um, the Gulf of Maine and Northeast U.S. shelf to shift from source waters that involve a mix of Labrador shelf water, which is this cold, fresh water that comes around the Grand Banks and along the coast, uh, and Atlantic tropical slope water, which is derived from the Gulf Stream and coming up much warmer and different nutrient content. Um, a shift away from Labrador slope water towards um, Atlantic tropical slope water under future conditions. And that actually tends to augment the warming one experiences in the system, but it's unclear what that does to the uh, Earth system dynamics, the biogeochemistry and the productivity of the system. So here we have another regional domain developed by our colleagues up at Rutgers, Enrique Kirchner and folks, where we uh, are now again running GFBL's biogeochemistry within that regional domain and starting to explore the effect of this change in source waters in a similar way to the example that I just showed you. And I think the key question here is how will these changes in biogeochemistry affect the ecological production units that the Northeast Fishery Science Center has de defined as a basis for their ecosystem-based management activities? So hopefully um, over the next six months we'll be um, uh, putting forth some results, initial results of the impacts of these um, climate-driven shifts in water masses on those properties. Lastly, I'll point out an example. Of, um, if you look at this, this last plot here, you see we're resolving shelves much better, but there are still many critical regions that lie beyond the reach of these regional ocean simulations. Particularly, you can barely make out all these critical estuarine systems along the coast of, of the East Coast here, including even ones as large as Chesapeake Bay, which, which uh, barely show up, and for a model that you know, has about five to 10 kilometer resolution, they're hard pressed to really fully simulate the dynamics in those estuaries. Um, in order to try and meet this challenge, we, we sort of recognize the fact that despite the fact they're very small in scale, they're often very rich in observations. And this plot here shows a plot of the number of CTD casts taken over the last 30 years in, um, in Chesapeake Bay. And if you count up the number taken each summer, it usually numbers between 300 to 600 CTD casts per summer in Chesapeake Bay. And you compare that to what we normally uh, observe across the entire shelf, and you realize that these are really intensely observed systems. For for estuaries, what we've been experimenting with is the capacity to potentially use statistical downscaling approaches, where we relate large-scale climate forcing uh, to local responses using this very rich observational data set. And this shows just an example. This work is funded actually by the uh, NOS and NCOS. Um, this shows an example of uh, the potential of this approach where um, on the left four panels here are surface temperature plots, one for a warm year and one for a cool year observed, and this is our statistical approximation of those years. So this one looks like this one, this one looks like this one, um, and then this one is for surface salinity. Uh, again, a salty year and a fresh year. And the statistical approach is allowing us to make inference about the basic estuarine habitat characteristics of this really very small region based on large-scale uh, climate forcing. So what I've talked about so far is really trying to extend this resilience and sustainability question down 
to finer and finer scales at which decisions uh, get made. But there's also this large space of additional questions that require shorter time scale information. And this requires that other configuration of GCMs that I, that I told you about, the, the initial value problem. And I'd like to end by talking a bit about some of the work we've been doing in that area. The first thing we've found is that even though GCMs are relatively coarse, usually one degree, maybe a half degree, I think the NSET model is a half degree ocean, uh, they can still provide fairly skillful uh, forecasts of SST anomalies in coastal regions. This plot here is a plot of the anomaly correlation coefficient. <laughs> My cell phone just went off. Hilarious. Um, this plot over here is the um, a plot of the forecast, anomaly correlation coefficient for seasonal forecasts of California current SST anomalies. Um, the red regions are areas of high skill and the blue regions are areas of low skill. The x-axis here is initialization month going from January to December and the y-axis is lead time. So you can see the red area uh, includes uh, many forecasts that go out to three or four months with very significant skill. And in some times, you can even extend that forecast skill out to six or seven months. We've also found that using the National Multimodal Ensemble can provide skill that exceeds or at least matches the best of the individual models uh, from, that, um, uh, from, from the ensemble itself. And this is just shown in the plot on the right here, where you have anomaly correlation coefficient, again, for the California current in this case. Uh, the black line is the NMME ensemble and the colored lines are the individual models, and you see the black line generally exceeds any of the individual models uh, during, in regions of significant skill. This was work uh, led by Gail Hervo in, in collaboration with Mike Alexander at Israel. So we actually have fairly skillful uh, environmental predictions over even shorter time scales. How do we use it? Uh, there's a burgeoning number of examples of this use, but here's the recent one that originated uh, from our lab where uh, Desiree Tomasi, who is a visiting scientist here, led a study that asked the question of whether these short-term SST forecasts could help us come up with better harvest control guidelines for Pacific sardine. Pacific sardine is a small pelagic fish. It fluctuates strongly with the environment. If we could anticipate those shifts a little bit better, perhaps we could catch more fish or at least better protect the stock from collapse. And so what Desiree did was consider a sequence of harvest control rules. Uh, the simplest had no environmental um, considerations. Then we went to one that considered just past sea surface temperature anomalies, and then a third one that considered the forecast sea surface temperature anomalies. This is the mean yield on here and the mean stock biomass. And what you see is the mean yield and the mean stock biomass tends to be higher if we're using skillful SST forecast. So here's a tangible example of where um, climate prediction may be able to allow us to catch more fish and catch them more safely as long as we combine them with existing harvest uh, cutoffs. Uh, Desiree is just starting to, to do more detailed work on this in collaboration with the stock assessment scientists here, and, and I think we're hopeful that, that this may be able to help in some small way. Um, Another aspect that we've been working on is moving beyond simply predicting the physical system and taking those same Earth system components and starting to, to actually do seasonal to decadal Earth system predictions. And this has been a, a foci of a, a tipping points initiative funded by OAR, where we've been trying to proceed through a, a number of steps, asking how do ecosystems integrate and respond to climate variability? How well do our Earth system models represent this response? What are the limits of Earth system predictability? And how do we initialize Earth system predictions? And at the end of this, we'll, we'll, we can get to monthly digital Earth system predictions that can link, um, uh, for instance, respond, responses and catch like the ones I showed for climate change, but for shorter time scales of seasons to decades. Um, I'm going to show two quick examples of progress on this front. The first is from Fernando Taboada, who is a visiting scientist here. And he was looking at this question about what are the predictability limits of ocean productivity. And what he did was decompose satellite-based uh, primary production estimates into a series of decay and interacting modes using a Bayesian uh, framework. And from this, he was able to infer the um, potential predictability of fluctuations in ocean productivity in the ocean. And um, here we've got three, six months, one year, and two years out. 
And the color shading here corresponds to the cor uh, anomaly correlation coefficient. Again, you see very strong predictive skill out three months in many regions of the ocean. The light areas are high predictability. And you see a real ring around the, um, the equatorial upwelling. Uh, generally, the high predictability showed up on the boundaries of biogeochemical systems where slight perturbations in biogeochemistry can leave lasting imprints that, that lead to long lead predictability. This high skill along these boundaries proceeds all the way out to a year. And even out to two years, we're getting some values that exceed 0.5 in the anomaly correlation. So this has given us some optimism about our ability to provide useful information with uh, Earth system predictions. We're even more uh, buoyed by the fact that our Earth system models tend to produce similar patterns of relative predictability when analyzed in the same way. This, again, is the satellite-based decomposition. And here is our decomposition of our Earth system model. And you see generally similar decay timescales and generally similar areas of elevated predictability relative to the background state. So this is trying to get at those areas of how predictable is it and how well do our models represent it. We've also just begun to make progress actually doing the initialization in terms of integrating biogeochemistry with our present data assimilative system. Uh, this is a, an example that's really hot off the press where we we're trying to initialize um, not just the physics, but the full biogeochemistry. On the left here, you see observed oxygen distributions in the subsurface of the ocean, 200 to 600 meters, and you see areas of low oxygen off the, um, the upwelling regions of the ocean and so forth. The upper right here is a control simulation that has no assimilation, no attempt to improve the initialization relative to its free running state. And you see large scale features look the same, but there are some obvious uh, biases and errors in the representation of this important ENSO driven region where the areas of low oxygen don't extend nearly as far as they should. The bottom, bottom plot here shows what happens when we begin to combine the physical um, free running physics with the data similar to physics, and it improves our ability to represent biogeochemical patterns in a meaningful way. Uh, essentially, this uh, bottom plot oxygen looks much more like the observations than the one that didn't consider assimilation. So this is giving us some hope that we will be able to provide skillful biogeochemical initial, initializations for these uh, predictions. So I hope this whirlwind tour is giving you a sense for some of the ways that we're trying to meet this challenge of providing information across space and time scales for marine resource management. A couple things on the horizon that I'm fairly excited about. The first is seamless Earth system prediction across space and time scales. And, and what this is, you know, we've been sort of downscaling the ocean, but we haven't really been downscaling the land and the atmosphere, and we haven't really been doing it in a seamless way. So, uh, our colleagues at Rutgers who have been doing this with have actually now started to work with our ocean model developers here to develop regional um, ocean modeling capacity uh, within MOM6, and we're combining that with uh, an already developed regional atmospheric capacity to hopefully provide a really holistic uh, Earth system downscaling that includes not just the ocean. That could include holistic linkages between terrestrial and ocean systems. We've been making good progress in, in incorporating dynamic nutrients so that we can model coastal eutrophication and pollution in addition to climate drivers of ecosystem change. We've been adopting our estuarine downscaling uh, 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 approach to the forecast-driven mode in the hopes that we could provide uh, seasonal uh, predictions of things like Vibrio and sea nettles and estuaries. And lastly, working towards not just having mechanistic plankton ecosystem models that can be related to fish, but actually having global fish models uh, that can really connect all the way up uh, the food chain to understand those regional changes in baseline fisheries productivity. Um, that's all I have. I'll just end with a, a, sort, a, a quick uh, acknowledgement of some of the diverse funding sources we've used. Of course, a lot of this is funded by, by base funding through NOAA, but uh, we've been able to, um, uh, to leverage uh, uh, many different um, uh, contributions from uh, different parts of NOAA and elsewhere, including CPO, to try and get this work done. So uh, thank you very much. Charlie, thanks so much. That was really excellent, really exciting stuff. Um, so uh, while everyone in the room considers whether they have any questions, I just want to remind folks on the line how to ask a question. So you can hover your cursor over the tab at the top center of your screen, and that's to say viewing climate program office. Uh, and then you can click the participants button and then the raise hand logo. 
and then I'll see a hand logo pop up next to your name, and I can unmute you and call on you. So are there any questions from anyone in the room? Um, I'll ask a question. So Charlie, you mentioned your um, the latest work you're doing for a couple data simulation that involves uh, geochemistry. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of that? Um, I know that's a big topic, but yeah, no, I mean there's uh, there's some key ones. Um, so the first thing we're trying to do is just actually get the biogeochemistry to interact with the data simulative physics, and. Uh, the trick there is that the biogeochemistry is much more sensitive to uh, things like slight uh, perturbations in the vertical velocity along the neutrocline. Uh, things that don't affect the heat or salt budget that much can have very profound impacts on the, um, the biogeochemistry. A little bit of extra nutrient into the euphotic zone can cause a big problem. So that's been our first uh, challenge, and I think we've come up with a number of, of ways to uh, uh, to move forward with that. Uh, the second challenge, of course, will be um, how to begin to use some of the biogeochemical data streams and assimilate those in addition to just combining the biogeochemistry with the data similar to physics. Uh, and I think once we do the first step, we'll start to think about the second. Uh, the thing that makes me optimistic is even that first step, even including biogeochemistry within that data similar to framework, seems to be providing some fairly stark improvements to some of the um, really pesky biases we've been trying to get rid of for, year, for years now. So um, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, but, uh, but I think there's reason to be optimistic. Great. So I see we have a question from Tim Schneider. Uh, Tim, I unmuted you. You can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me okay? I'm over the computer. Yep, we hear you fine. Great. Hey, um, thanks for the great presentation. It was really fascinating. Um, y you seem to employ a lot of downscaling in your work, and uh, having given some thought about it from a land surface water resources perspective, um, you know, there's lots of approaches. I'm curious what approaches you've employed to do your downscaling and what sort of best practices and lessons learned you guys have found so far. Yeah, there's a, there's a half-written paper on that that I need to get to. But um, so we've kind of tried to use both global modeling approaches and downscale, and I think, I think both have strengths. Um, what, what downscaling seems to provide is, you know, it's essentially providing a way to extrapolate the implications of the large-scale patterns projected by a GCM to understand the local scale impacts. A challenge seems to be that a lot of times the regional biases in global climate models make it difficult to do that in a straightforward way because you essentially end up with a, with a fine scale biased result. And um, so we've been working on different ways to both downscale and potentially bias correct those uh, simulations. I think ultimately um, a, a key, it's key that both the global models and the regional downscaling frameworks improve in parallel so that it's much easier to downscale a global model that's already doing fairly well at that regional scale uh, than one that already has a fairly large bias that one has to come up with ways to correct. Um, uh, for the estuaries, I think it was just a case of um, you know, when presented with the problem of trying to do a downscaling for estuaries, we said, well, it's really hard to cross that many scales dynamically with our present situation, but we do have these great observational data sets. And for, for temperature and salinity, the estuaries respond in very um, predictable ways. You know, if you, if you pump a lot of fresh water into two estuary, you're going to have lower salinities. If, if the atmosphere is anomalously warm, the estuary is soon to follow. And so uh, with that, it just seemed like the statistical approach, which a statistical approach is often naturally considered both scale and bias, was, a, um, was sort of a logical way forward. And I, I actually do kind of see that as being 
a potentially critical part of an overarching estuarine downscale capacity moving forward. We, we definitely do need to have dynamical approaches in estuaries as well because we need to extend beyond the things we observe directly. But I think taking advantage of the observational database we have in estuaries to also have statistical approaches that can be rapidly expanded across ensembles is a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's got enough advantages that I think we need to, to fully explore it. Great, thank you. Thanks, Tim and Charlie. Okay, I don't see any okay. other hands raised, but uh, if you have other questions, we might be able to get to them at the end. But uh, in the meantime, Charlie, thanks so much for your excellent presentation. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Isaac Kaplan. And uh, Isaac, you should have control or ability to um, show your presentation, and while you Great. get your Great. presentation loaded, I'll just introduce you. So Isaac is a research fishery biologist at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington. He's a member of the Conservation Biology Division and the Integrated Marine Ecology Team. His recent, fo his recent focus has been in two areas. Uh, the first is the development of Atlantis ecosystem models that simulate food webs, fisheries, and oceanography. And then uh, secondly, contributing to JSCOPE's seasonal forecast of ocean conditions for the Pacific Northwest. JSCOPE has been used to forecast ocean physics and biogeochemistry up to six months in advance and to predict habitat for sardines in areas likely to experience ocean acidification and hypoxia. His ongoing work relates to these forecasts to Dungeness crab and Pacific cake. And whenever you're ready, Isaac, take it away. Great, thanks very much, Heather, and uh, thank you to you and Roger and the MAP program for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Um, yeah, so my talk is about JSCOPE, which is just how seasonal coastal ocean prediction of the ecosystem. Let me just check and make sure Heather can see the slides okay. Yeah, it looks great. All right, great. Um, I want to acknowledge co-authors, in particular, Samantha Sudlecki, Al Herman, Nick Bond, Tam Wen, Jan Newton, and Simone Allen on this talk. But um, as usual, there's a large cast of characters uh, providing uh, many different parts of this project. And I also wanted to acknowledge the funding uh, right off the bat, University of Washington, NANUS, IUS, PMEL, uh, NOAA FATE, of course, uh, NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center, where I am, the Coastal Modeling Group at UW, and JASAO, which is the joint institute between NOAA and University of Washington. Um, so the goal of JSCOPE is really to, to make forecasts up to six to nine months in advance for the California current. Our model domain is shown here. We're really uh, covering the Pacific Northwest, so the coast of Oregon, Washington, and parts of British Columbia. And we're really able to leverage uh, two existing products. One is the Climate Forecast System, or CFS, that we're using to force the coarse scale physics for our region. Uh, giving us some predictability up to six to nine months in advance. And then, as I'll talk about more in a second, we're able to use a regional ocean modeling system, or ROMS, to downscale these results. And from my perspective in a fisheries agency, really getting to the level of coastal processes important for a coastal fisheries on the shelf and continental slope is really crucial, and that's the, that's the downscaling that Charlie was just talking about. Um, Again, as Charlie mentioned, there's this great paper that Desiree Tomasi put together, really thinking about the, the uh, spatial and temporal scales across which we make marine resource management decisions and across which uh, forecasting can be of use. And if you can see my cursor um, for JSCOPE in particular, we're thinking of forecasts on the season of, on the scale of months and on the spatial scale of tens to hundreds of kilometers. And in a fisheries context, this is really important, in particular for industry operations, and then for questions about monitoring, spatial closures, and then in-season adjustments to when and where fisheries can operate. So we, uh, <clears throat> we're sort of working perhaps from a slightly different end of this diagram than most of what Charlie just presented on, but working towards the same themes. So uh, JSCOPE is committed to producing forecasts and releasing them um, via the web. So if you want, you can go to our website, which is shown here on the bottom, take a look at some of the forecasts. This is the most recent forecast we made. 
uh, which was initialized in April of 2016. Uh, typically, we have an ensemble of forecasts in January, initialized in January, and then another one initialized in April. And you can see the types of variables that we're predicting, uh, bottom oxygen, chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and bottom pH. And then we're also um, coming up with some synoptic indices that are related to how the ecosystem functions and how our fisheries respond. In particular, uh, the upwelling index is shown here uh, animated across the bottom panel. Um, and this is, uh, maybe this is also a contrast between the, the sort of uh, global models that Charlie was showing you and the spatial scale that's uh, particularly relevant to our, our nearshore fisheries. And that's, that's what the downscaling via ROMs is giving us here. So let me just talk a little bit more about the components of the system of JScope. Um, again, we're using CFS, we're using the climate forecast system, um, which is giving us information, but at the scale of about 50 kilometers for the ocean. Uh, Samantha Sidlecki in particular has uh, integrated this with the ROMs, the UW Cascadia setup uh, from Parker McCready's group. Uh, Sam has improved the oxygen and detritus handling in particular for the ROMs. And this gets us down to about 1.5 kilometers resolution, again, which is really critical for the, the nearshore fisheries. And I'll talk some more about that in a minute. Um, as a first step, uh, Sam Sedlecki and Simone Allen have developed empirical relationships uh, to translate from physics and oxygen to pH. And then most recently, they've started dynamically modeling uh, pH and aragonite saturation state using JScope. And then, as I'll show you in a minute, we're also uh, creating empirical relationships between sardine presence or sardine distribution and forecasts from JScope. Uh, so in a, in a paper that Samantha said, like you just released this year in scientific reports, we detail uh, some of the properties and characteristics and also uh, lessons learned from JScope. Um, and also quite a bit of uh, skill assessment of the model and how it performs against observations. Um, an example here on the top is forecasted sea surface temperature anomaly or our 2016 um, forecast that was initialized in January. So this is the anomaly in degrees Celsius uh, with red colors indicating, um, so the, the dark red is a four degrees Celsius anomaly. Um, and so you can see here for summer 2016, the forecast is really bringing in information about the anomalously warm conditions, which of course have characterized the Pacific uh, Northwest in the last few years. And um, this is uh, what we locally call the blob. Nick Bond has, has given it the moniker of the blob, but it's uh, very warm ocean conditions that are having a very strong impact on our local uh, fish and local ecology. Um, on the bottom, you can see uh, the quantification of uncertainty. And this has largely been the work of Samantha Sedlecki and Tam Wen. And what they've done is, uh, in the last couple of years, they've been able to create mini ensembles with three initializations of each of our forecasts. So we're able to start to capture some of the uncertainty in the forecasts uh, related to those initial conditions. And so here, essentially, the, the dark blue areas are the areas of higher uncertainty, which is essentially a measure of the coefficient of variation around the members of this ensemble. Um, and so the dark blue colors or darker blue colors March and April here um, off Washington represent a 10 to 15 percent uh, coefficient of variation or uncertainty um, as opposed, and that's in March and April. And then um, in May and June, we see larger uncertainty in particular off Oregon, again at the level of about 10 percent variation between these members of the ensemble. Uh, one of my contributions to the effort has been to try to understand sardine distribution and sardine uh, habitat in relation to these JScope forecasts. And so uh, this was a paper that we put out uh, last year. Um, and essentially what we did here was use the JScope forecasts of temperature, salinity, and chlorophyll uh, to make predictions about sardine habitat, fitting a generalized linear model to 2009 observations. And so on the left, you see those 2009 model fit, uh, where green are areas that are predicted to have sardine, and uh, black are the observations, the actual observations from the field, from trawl surveys or aerial surveys. Uh, the critical thing here is that the model in 2009 in that left-hand panel 
is able to uh, predict that sardine will make their summertime migration uh, up into Canada, up into the waters off of uh, Vancouver Island, uh, which is one of the critical uh, factors that's relevant to the, the fishing industry, in particular the Canadian fishing industry, and then also to fishery management for this shared stock. So we fit the model for 2009, and then we evaluated the model skill uh, in 2013 and 2014, and um, observed pretty good skill. Uh, so we tend to measure skill using AUC. So the AUC scores uh, were about 0.85 and 0.96 for August 2013 and August 2014, indicating that most of the time the model is correctly predicting that sardines stay in U.S. waters in the summer, uh, and most of the green or most of the sardine habitat is predicted to be in U.S. waters. Um, which matches the observations. So the gray dots off the Canadian waters indicate that uh, trawl surveys were done, but sardine were not observed in those locations. Um, so in terms of challenges of the model, um, these, these earlier slides, so 2009, 2013, 2014, um, were during periods of relatively, uh, relatively high sardine abundance. And then in the last two years, sardine abundance has declined, um, not so much because of local habitat, but more likely due to recruitment or production of juveniles. And so a challenge in this type of modeling is understanding that and then incorporating it into the sardine forecasts. And so essentially what's happened in the last two years is the model is predicting good habitat in the north all the way up into Canada, and that's partly driven by these warm conditions that we see in the model and that have also been observed with this, uh, this warm blob anomaly. So we see good habitat all the way up to Vancouver Island in the north, um, and yet the sardine stock and the sardine recruitment is, is insufficient to actually occupy that habitat. Um, and so the skill that we saw earlier has started to fall off in the last two years for sardine in particular. Um, and so what we've done most recently is go back and think very carefully. Um, initially we picked sardine because empirical observations suggested that Sardine, which live in the surface, are very uh, responsive to changing surface conditions, especially sea surface temperature. And so we, what we've done is we've gone back to the uh, skill assessment, uh, which we now have available to us from the 2016 work, and we now understand that our J-scope system has much better predictability of bottom conditions, so in particular bottom temperature and bottom oxygen. So these plots show you uh, sea surface temperature versus bottom temperature and bottom oxygen. Uh, where the correlation um, is a, as a measure of skill is shown here um, with significant correlations above 0 0.5 for both bottom temperature and bottom oxygen for much of our coast. And so we've really gone back to the drawing board and tried to think about what are the species and what are the fisheries management issues uh, that can benefit most from this most skillful part of the forecasts. This just shows you the same idea. This is a, uh, the relationship between model bottom temperature on the x-axis and observational bottom temperature on the y-axis with a very tight correlation, r squared is almost 0 0.9, uh, for the model forecasts for 2009 through 2014. Uh, so our effort now is really to focus on the species that are living uh, near the bottom or at least in midwaters uh, and not, not surface fish like sardine. Uh, one of the projects that we've just started uh, focuses around hake. This is one of our largest fisheries on the West Coast, uh, tens of millions of dollars typically each year. Um, and hake are not a surface fish, they're considered either, the, either a ground fish or a, a midwater fish. Um, and they are known to respond to water temperature and then also to the strength of the undercurrent. And so I won't talk a lot about that, but we're trying to combine some of the early thinking about hake distribution, for instance by Agostini et al, where this diagram is from, combine that uh, and test the skill of J-scope to measure and predict uh, hake distributions. Uh, the other species that we're focusing on is the most valuable fishery on the West Coast right now, which is Dungeness crab. Um, it's a, typically uh, close to $200 million fishery on the West Coast, and Dungeness crab are known to respond to bottom oxygen and bottom temperature. Um, of course, the adults are, are living on the bottom uh, larvae can be up in the water column, but the adults are spending their life on the bottom. And uh, we know that, especially in the summer, there are hypoxic events that lead to uh, wash up of dead crabs on the beach, so mortality events. And then work by Keller et al. has illustrated that uh, crab are uh, in higher abundance in areas with uh, higher oxygen concentrations. 
and then work by Froelich et al. illustrates that activity levels increase, uh, in particular when oxygen is low, um, on the right here, illustrating that uh, there may be some sort of intolerance of, of uh, low oxygen conditions for a Dungeness crab. Um, one of the pilot studies that we've started for Dungeness crab has focused on the larvae and the megalope rather than the adults. Uh, this is the work of Susanna Officer. It was a pilot project this summer, and she was able to fit generalized linear models, um, finding significant relationships between nitrate, uh, gradient, which is a uh, proxy for distance to the oceanographic front, aragonite saturation state, salinity, and phytoplankton, relating that to uh, uh, megalope, and she was able to uh, have uh, a, a fair amount of skill, moderate skill, to predict uh, presence of, of uh, crab larvae and megalope in red. Uh, so red are the observations where the crab were observed, and blue are the areas where the model is predicting that crab were observed. Um, the step that we've most recently undertaken for, uh, for the Dungeness crab has been to really focus on um, trying to understand and map out what the management needs are and what the seasonal decisions are that managers are, are taking. Um, this diagram, again, is from Desiree Tomasi's uh, paper and review, and it really echoes a lot of the, the thinking uh, that's arisen from Alistair Hobday's group in Australia. Uh, but the key thing here is that if we're going to uh, think about taking forecasts and linking them to living marine resources and living marine resource management, delivering those forecasts and quantifying the skill, if we're going to go through all of the steps in this diagram, we really need to first sit down with managers, and in this case state managers and tribal managers, and understand how they make those decisions, especially those the sort of seasonal or what we call in-season decisions. And so that's, uh, that's what we're doing now. Um, we have essentially decided that uh, the forecasts that we use that are initialized, the forecasts we currently have, which are initialized in January and April, uh, are useful to managers. And they've, they've identified that they're useful to managers in uh, identifying hypoxic areas, which are important in case fishermen need to avoid areas that essentially trap crabs in, their, in, in pots and kill them. And then we're also proposing a new forecast in the fall and early September uh, to help fishermen right now, in, typically in November, as they're trying to make these decisions, in particular decisions about um, when to open the fishery, how to share that fishery between the state and tribal operations and, and fishers, and then also uh, which areas to open. And those are all decisions that are made, being made right now on the water. Um, so I just want to conclude with a few uh, main points here. Uh, first of all, we have forecasts 2009, 2013 through 2014, and now into 2016. Um, in uh, Samantha Sudlecki's paper this year, we're demonstrating substantial skill uh, on the seasonal time scale out to about six months, uh, in particular in the subsurface variables, and certainly for variables relevant to fisheries and uh, ecosystem management. We're really uh, lucky to be able to take advantage of CFS and um, to improve on ROMS uh, applications from University of Washington. Uh, we're able to take advantage of uh, the network that NANUS in particular has with stakeholders and the real-time observation network that they have available to us. Um, and the current efforts are really focusing on uh, species, particular midwater and benthic species like hake and dungeness crab. And thank you very much. Heather, thanks a lot. I'm not sure if there's time for questions now or later, but I'm glad to answer any now or offline. Great. Thanks so much, Isaac. Um, so are there any questions for Isaac in the room? Jay. Yeah. Hey, Isaac. It's Jay Peterson. Uh, I noticed you're using uh, anomalies or presenting anomalies um, on some of the plots. It, it, do the models resolve actual values pretty well for temperature and oxygen, and would those be valuable for being able to predict sardine and habitat and maybe for some other species? Right, yeah, so right. all yeah. of these models all, all of these models have biases, and a lot of what we've done um, and a lot of what we did in the 2016 Sedlecki et al. paper was really quantify those biases and understand them. Um, in particular, uh, the J-scope ROMs right now tends to be warm, very warm in the summer, uh, several degrees warmer than observations, which is, of course, why we focus on anomalies rather than, uh, than the actual absolute degrees Celsius. 
Um, part of that is related to winds. Part of it is related to uh, how we handle solar insulation. And I think we're working on those biases now, although I, I also feel uh, like perhaps the, the major responsibility is to document those, and to some extent those biases will always be present. We just need to understand them. The sardine example is a good one where um, uh, we dealt with the bias head on by fitting the model to forecasts uh, for 2009 so that those biases were incorporated into the generalized linear model. And so, and we use the same forecasts with the same inherent biases to make forecasts of 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016. And um, uh, I think that's the right way to handle it in this particular case, uh, but we had to be really careful about um, uh, making sure that the biases were accounted for and that they were consistent between the model fitting and the model projections. Great, thanks. Yeah. yeah, this is Jim Huang from CPO. I have a quick question. So for your uh, uh, app, uh, the feature application, do you get all the required variables from CFS? Uh, I remember in for the like a water resource application, people uh, ask them uh, like a three dimensional variables from CFS, but they don't, they cannot get it in real time. Uh, good question. I might have to ask Samantha Sudlecki more about that. I think she's able to access, uh, Samantha Sudlecki and Al Herman are able to access uh, everything thanks to CFS. Um, okay. I think they're able to get what they need, but I could uh, <coughs> certainly relay that to them. Okay. Thanks. thanks. Hey, thanks. Um, any questions from the virtual world? See, Kim, you still have your hand up, but I assume you don't have a question. Okay, if not, Isaac, thanks very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to transfer presenter uh, privileges over to Kristen. Kristen, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll just introduce you while you uh, load your talk. So Kirsten is a research fishery biologist uh, with the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center, uh, which is also in Seattle, Washington. And her current work is focused on developing quantitative methods for ecosystem-based approaches to management and methods to assess and manage for climate-driven changes to fish and fisheries. In particular, Kirsten's work includes the development and application of climate-specific multi-species stock assessment models for the Bering Sea. Uh, integrated ecosystem assessments, bioenergetics, and food web models, and field studies, the multi-trophic effects of fishery and agriculture interactions with marine and estuarine ecosystems. And Kristen, I see your presentation up on the screen, so go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for the introduction, and thank you to Heather and the MAP program, and Roger for uh, for having us today, and so thank you also for sticking around for the third talk in today's uh, set. So I think uh, and we're going to uh, kind of zoom out a little bit from where Isaac was talking about short-term uh, projections and look at a, a longer-term uh, projection landscape. And in particular, I'm going to talk about a project we have uh, underway called ACLIMB, which couples physical, biological, and socioeconomic models in order to evaluate alternative uh, management, fisheries management approaches in Alaska. Before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors on this project, uh, on this talk and on the project, uh, in particular, Ann Hollywood, who is a, a co-PI, uh, lead PI on it, as well as the broader ACLIM team, which includes about 19 different researchers at the University of Washington, at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, and at UAF, University of Alaska. And this is a, a team of researchers that are involved in uh, physical and lower trophic modeling and, and research, as well as uh, biological modeling in terms of uh, ecosystem models, as well as uh, folks that are working on socioeconomic models. And so it's a real great team to be working with uh, to address this, this question. And really the impetus for the work is uh, to simulate and evaluate how some of these climate-driven or physically-driven changes to bottom-up driver, drivers of productivity in the system can interact 
with top-down controls, so both trophic top-down controls, but also uh, the fisheries and the harvest and our management approaches in the Bering Sea in particular, and how that influences the productivity of the, of the region. And we're interested in this because fisheries productivity in Alaska is uh, extremely important, and it's, uh, it's been uh, one of the most productive regions globally uh, for some time now. About half of all of U.S. fish that are landed in the United States come from Alaska, and about 90% of that comes from the Bering Sea. So the Bering Sea is a very large, shallow shelf. It's very productive, uh, produces a, a lot of ground fish in particular, for example, walleye pollock, which is a, a very large fishery and, and helps provide um, sort of marine-based protein for the, for the globe worldwide. Um, the fisheries in the region are, are characterized uh, by a, leg uh, a legacy of sustainability. So they're, they're not only productive, but they've been productive for a very long time, and management in the region has been largely uh, successful from that standpoint. So what we want to do is ensure that its productivity continues uh, going forward and, and that our management continues to respond and in, a, in a responsive way to changes in the system. One of the things about the Bering Sea that, that is interesting and probably contributes largely to, to its productivity is that the conditions there are very dynamic. So if we look back over uh, the time scale that we've been uh, really intensively studying the system, so we've got about 30 years, 30 plus years of survey uh, data for the system. Uh, if you look at, at just changes in bottom temperature, which are plotted here, you'll see that it, it varies considerably year to year. And in fact, we've had stanzas of multiple years of, of warm conditions followed by multiple years of cold conditions and then switching back. And we appear to be moving into another stanza of multiple years of, of warmer conditions. And this is important because this, these um, stanzas of warm conditions and cold conditions set up dynamics, trophic interactions, as well as physical interactions that, that translate to changes in productivity. And so we've had uh, a number of really excellent large-scale research projects in the area. One of the ones that just wrapped up was uh, funded by the North Pacific Research Board. It's called the Bering Sea Integrated Research Project, and that project spanned about seven years, and so it spanned some of these stanzas of cold and warm conditions. And that project looked at everything from physical to uh, lower trophic to upper trophic dynamics and, and really helped uh, delineate various hypotheses of the mechanisms that were controlling fish productivity in particular in the system. And so on the left here, um, on the top upper left, you'll see uh, the start of a time series of panels showing the Bering Sea from above. And what's shown in this image is a real important feature for the system. It's this, this cold pool of water that we refer to as the cold pool, and it's, it's delineated there in the blue color. So everything in blue is bottom water on the shelf that is less than or equal to two degrees. And it is, essentially a memory of sea ice in the system. So in the winter, sea ice comes down into the Bering Sea. It's driven by currents and, uh, and winds. It, to, to differing degrees, it will come down and extend into the Bering Sea. And then in the spring, it melts and it retracts. And when it does that, it leaves behind this sort of memory of sea ice, this cold body of water. And it's important because some uh, fish species, it's important for circulation and, and productivity, but it's also important from the standpoint that some fish species will enter the cold pool and others will not. And so it, it mediates predator and prey interactions in the system. And so what we've learned from studying the sort of uh, multi-year impacts of, of having warm and cold stanzas in the Bering Sea is that in general, more ice in the winter leads to conditions that promote not only higher productivity, but a, a pathway of productivity that's typified by larger phytoplankton and zooplankton that has higher lipid content. So it's a, it's a higher quality food, which uh, contributes uh, to higher growth rates for juvenile fish, including uh, forage species and juvenile pollock, which we think then translates into higher uh, adult populations two to three years later and, and higher, ultimately higher catch. So the, the mechanisms, the specific mechanisms of how uh, this plays out are, is, is a real active area of research. So in general, we have these higher overwinter survivals and higher productivity in colder regimes and, and somewhat lower uh, dynamics in, in warmer regimes. Uh, but there's still uh, a, a quite a bit of discussion about exactly how those mechanisms 
play out in that ecosystem. And so the, pro the idea behind ACLIMB was to take those hypotheses and put them into a modeling framework and evaluate the relative sensitivity of, of things like bottom-up drivers uh, to the system and top-down controls, including fisheries harvest and management approaches. We know that fisheries harvest and management can have a big influence on the, on the system. Uh, and the, the question is how that, how that compares to some of these bottom-up drivers in magnitude. And so the ACLINE project um, will take, or is in the process, we've, we're about a year and a half in now, has, has taken uh, physical models here, uh, global climate models, downscaled them into a regional ocean circulation model that's coupled to an MPZ, a nutrient phytoplankton, zooplankton model, that also has krill. And then we are then downscaling those projections into uh, various ecosystem and socioeconomic models. And so I'm going to go ahead and step through the, uh, the different components of this. Um, but really the, the idea is to try to uh, make explicit some of the implicit error that we do account for currently in our stock assessment um, and, and ecosystem models. So these can include things such as observation error, so how much um, measurement the error there is when we go out and, and sample the environment, how much uh, error or variability is due to random noise in the system, how much uh, error or variability is introduced just through assumptions about how trophic interactions are defined in each of these models, and how much uh, the, the socioeconomic system is, how much detail there is there in the models. And so by parsing these out, we can help focus some of our, our future research efforts. So there's the physical and biological uh, downscaling uh, component links into these uh, coupled socio and economics um, uh, teams, and there's 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 uh, individuals that are focused on all of these. We all meet once a month uh, to to coordinate, but there's different focal components. And so the first part I want to talk about is the physical and, uh, and MPZ modeling. This is work largely led by Al Herman and Wei Chang at, at Jaseo and PMEL. And they've gone through the, uh, the task of taking a ROMS MPZ model, and the, this ROMS MPZ model is a generation of model that was developed under the Bering Sea Integrated Research Project, and they've now uh, linked that into um, more recent global climate projections for the region. So the model is a, a descendant of the NAP5, and it has, uh, because the shelf is rather shallow, it has 10 layers, it's a 10 kilometer grid, grid but, and the details of it you can find in Al Herman's uh, publications in Deep Sea Research 2 in 2013 and more recently in 2016. But the real key is um, that this regional model can replicate some of those important features like the cold pool that we, uh, w that we need to uh, be able to simulate in order to assess trophic interactions in the system. So this is an example of, of what that downscaling looks like. On the left is the global climate model. In this case, it's the MIROC model. You can see that it predicts uh, colder conditions in the north and warmer conditions in the south, but there's not a delineation of a, of a cold pool feature in these predictions. When you downscale that into the regional ocean model, we start to pick up that cold pool uh, feature that is so important. And Al has done uh, quite a bit of time, um, quite a bit of work looking at how the model performs as compared to, to actual observations from the system. So on the left, you can see observations uh, from the summer of 2009 of bottom temperature. And these are um, actual uh, delineations of those observations. So you can see the magnitude and extent of the cold pool in 2009 and that the model uh, when uh, hindcast using the core CFS models uh, reproduces that, that uh, feature pretty well. Here's another way to, to look at this. This is now the pr uh, proportion of stations where the observed temperatures are less than two degrees. So it's an index of that cold pool area, and then the model predictions uh, of that same index. And you can see we track, track it pretty well. There's a, a few years where the model um, over or underestimates that cold pool area, but in general, it's picking up the dips and valleys and that, that important physical feature. So what we've done for the ACLINE project is we've taken the hind cast of that model, which is uh, shown here in the red, and each of the lines is the annual value for, in this case, uh, mean bottom temperature in the summer. And then the, the thicker line is a, a five-year running mean. 
And we've then uh, forced that, Alan Way has forced that with boundary conditions from a variety of different global climate projections. And so we have both warm projections for the region and projections uh, that continue uh, current conditions. And the idea here was to really get a breadth of a range of projections for the system that we could then run through our management strategy evaluation in order to test how our management performs under this range of possible futures. And so the component that I uh, work on on the project is, is a, a component of the biological modeling. And so I want to take a minute to talk about how we're going to take those physical projections and drive them through this, these biological models in order to test, uh, do the stress test of our management approaches. And so um, if we go ahead and look at these, just before uh, we get into them, I just want to point out that all five, all of our mo uh, uh, coupled socio-ecological uh, um, models include five core species of interest, um, as well as the effect on, on fisheries and fishing communities. But then because of the complexity of different models, some of those models are also tracking other components of the ecosystem. And we are able to do this because we have a very rich data set for the Bering Sea that includes fishery uh, observations that are collected in cooperation with the fishery. So we have observers on boats that are collecting information about catch and bycatch, but they're also collecting information about the physical conditions uh, during, the, during the harvest, so this is outside of our, our regular sampling period, so in seasons we may not be out there. And they're also collecting, uh, as part of this, diet information. We have our regular trawl surveys um, in the Bering Sea that take place in the summer that give us information about predators and their, and their diet compositions and their distributions and, and biomass in the system. And then we have surveys that take place in the spring and fall and help quantify lower trophic dynamics, uh, things like phytoplankton, zooplankton, and forage species, and, and juvenile pollock. So we put all of that information into these biological models, and we have really five classes of models that, that we're using in ACLIMB that range in their, I guess you could call it their trophic complexity from climate-enhanced single-species models all the way up to models that are fully embedded in the ROMS MPZ uh, framework. So, uh, this feast model is, is, uh, has fish dynamics that are actually embedded in the ROMS MPZ. Um, but another way to think of this is that there's a spectrum of implicit error to explicit delineation of error and, and how that propagates through. So on the, on the sort of right-hand side of this, the, the feast model has uh, fish moving around within the ROMS MPZ grid and redistributing based on uh, pretty uh, uh, sort of first principles of fish interactions with their environment and their food resources. And the model then is able to produce nice uh, uh, spatial predictions of hotbeds of growth and, and uh, uh, species distributions. It, and this is, uh, of course, helps us understand perhaps some of the mechanisms that might be driving distributions in the system. Uh, but it is, it is a, um, a, a computationally expensive model. And so one step down from that, we also have uh, a uh, ecosystem model for the Bering Sea. It's not spatial, but it has a high resolution of species uh, delineations. And we can force this model through changing things like the phytoplankton uh, component of the model from the, the MPZ projections in Hindcast. Dr. Jonathan Rehm, is, uh, as part of the project, is also building a size spectrum model that's species specific for the, the Bering Sea. He's doing this in um, uh, collaboration with Julia Blanchard to, to modify the MISER package. And this has slightly different rules about how fish would eat other fish in the, in the model. And so it provides a nice contrast to the EcoPath with the EcoSim model. And then finally, the, um, we have a, a series of climate-enhanced um, multi-species and single-species stock assessment models. And these models have different assumptions about how physical conditions might directly drive things like growth or uh, recruitment of, of species in the, uh, of interest in these models or uh, might modulate trophic interactions in a pretty simplistic way. So these are uh, of the... Um, of the uh, type of mice models of intermediate complexity. 
And just to, to give you a, a flavor for what that looks like, here is uh, log recruitment for Pollock, uh, estimated by uh, our multi-species model, so the open circles and the lines are estimates of recruitment. We fit a mean uh, ricker, which is this dot dash line here, so that's just assuming that recruitment is a function of, of biomass under mean conditions. And then we fit a ricker with covariates from the ROMS MPZ model, which are shown both in the red and the blue, so two different uh, examples of that. And the, those covariates with the ROMs and uh, indices pick up some of the dips and valleys in recruitment. So we can project that approach forward to see how changes in things like bottom-up drivers of productivity might influence recruitment. But the other real important component of this is how fishing and harvest pressure might change as you change uh, abundances and distributions of fish in the system. And so this is, uh, it, it's our projections are very sensitive to how that uh, dynamic is, is um, modeled. And so one of the large components of ACLIME is to have a socioeconomic modeling team that's going to specifically link in the, uh, the sort of human dynamics and pressures and link that in with these biological uh, models. And that socioeconomic team is composed of uh, a number of folks here at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And, uh, and they are, uh, the, that's actually work that's underway right now. They're in the process of delineating different uh, sort of management scenarios, something like what we have now, which would be um, uh, adjusting harvest depending on the biomass that's in the system versus uh, alternative options like maximum economic yield or a proxy thereof. And so we're going to evaluate how sensitive these projections are to those different approaches and also uh, whether or not uh, certain approaches work better under certain conditions. So, so far we've um, been up and running for about a year and a half and we've uh, encountered some challenges in doing the, the project as you might expect, um, but I think uh, uh, they're not, they have not been insurmountable. So one of the, uh, one of the bigger challenges was uh, selecting the global climate models we want to use want to use in the analysis, we went with a, a uh, sort of a megaphone approach. We wanted to bracket the range of possibilities. Uh, the computing capacity was, is, a, is going to be a limitation whenever you're doing a project of this scale. We had uh, nodes in place and, and had a few um, nodes go down, and so making sure that we keep that infrastructure uh, up and running is important for continuing to do these kinds of evaluations. And then data sharing and translating model outputs is something that we've been talking about since the very beginning. And uh, the different models with different uh, inputs and outputs and different modeling frameworks uh, uh, it just means that you have to find a common currency. What we ended up uh, using as a, as a common currency was taking net CDF files, turning it into our uh, data um, uh, objects, and then those can be uh, read into the various models. And then models, um, of course, are based on current ecological understanding. So as those have been evolving very rapidly uh, with our observations of the system, we've been updating and trying to incorporate that science directly into, uh, into our framework. We have a real uh, strong integrated research program at the center, and so we benefit from the ability of not having to worry about lags between the physical, biological, and socioeconomic sciences. So we're we're all in the same room, we meet monthly, and we talk about some of the evolution of, of, uh, of those sciences, and we can put them pretty quickly into the modeling framework. We have a really good group of people that is willing to share and work together, which really helps. And then we've also been doing an iterative engagement with the council. So uh, we've, we've been presenting and then getting feedback on this project as it's been evolving, and that's uh, extremely helpful for tailoring these management strategy evaluations. And then finally, just to, to sort of um, bring this back to the, the talks that Charlie and, and Isaac gave, one of the things that's really been exciting about this project is to see how these long-term analyses inform uh, some of our short-term forecasts. So you've seen this, this graphic from Desiree's uh, recent paper, and we're sort of out on the right-hand side of this with the project. But in order to parameterize the relationship between uh, the environment, these lower trophic dynamics, and fishing pressure and, and management approaches, uh, we've, we've uh, necessarily informed some of our shorter term understandings as well. And it's, it's actually a bit of an iterative process. And so we're seeing a uh, co-evolution of both of these longer term 
uh, projection experiments and these shorter term forecasting uh, skills. And so that's real exciting uh, for us here at the center. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. I just want to thank uh, the various uh, funding uh, supports for the project, and I'd also like to uh, thank the NOAA, NOAA IEA program, which has been a, uh, an important part of continuing to keep this work going forward. Thank you. Great, Kirsten. Thanks so much. That was a great presentation and really nice compliment to the other two. Uh, so are there any questions of anyone in the room? Um, so I know, I know it's early in the project, but it's pretty neat results uh, already with the forecast. Is there, have you already been presenting it to councils of where they might be using any of the information qualitatively, um, like from the forecast from the Feast or Seattle model? Yeah, so the, um, the short-term forecasts actually are incorporated into a, a report that's part of the annual stock assessment um, uh, process. It's called the Ecosystem Considerations Report, and the short-term forecasts are in there and provide, uh, I didn't present it here, but provide a, a nine-month uh, forecast out of the physical conditions. And we're really moving towards taking that. I think right now it's done in a uh, sort of a qualitative discussion mode. Uh, but really the, the future is to go towards some of those products like Isaac was showing with JScope, which is to forecast that into recruitment and try to understand what the potential changes in recruitment will be. So we're, we're almost there, but we're, we're just we're still evaluating and testing that. Um, but the longer term forecast, we have been presenting it to uh, industry and to the council uh, in order to help sort of frame the range of possible responses that they may uh, put in place so we, we've done this in, in terms of uh, trying to scope what you might call representative fishing pathways or future uh, fishing scenarios. And there's going to be a lot of work done on this uh, just starting, I think, about a month um, through uh, spring because there's a couple of different projects. Uh, Belmont Forum is going to have a, a project working with um, the council to, to refine those as well as uh, Stephen and, and Alan have a workshop plan to do that as well. So. We'll see what those, it, it, it's a great dialogue that we have with industry and with the councils, and so it's, it's helpful to help refine the, the range of flexible solutions that might be there. It's a good question, though. Thanks. Now, uh, I don't see any other questions, but I do want to give everyone the opportunity to ask any questions um, from any of the three talks, and I actually unmuted the three presenters in case they'd like to ask questions of each other. And it looks like Isaac, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yes, I got my head up yep, <laughs> electronically. Um, yep. So I just wanted to ask Kirsten a bit more about how she, what she sees as the role of the size spectrum models and how they fit into what you can learn from a model like Feast and from Ecosim. Uh, my, my knowledge of them is that they might help handle diets and predation in cases where uh, diet data is lacking, but I think that Alaska probably has uh, quite good diet information. Well, no, that's actually, I mean, I, I that you nailed it. I think it helps um, uh, set up alternative hypotheses for those species where we have a little less information. So the Ecopath and Ecosim model for those uh, that aren't as familiar with it is, is largely parameterized off of um, patterns that you see in the diet data, but for species where you don't have a lot of diet information, you can bracket it, but it, it may not, um, uh, it, it emerges out of the, the model uh, framework. And so the size spectrum model sets up a, a different set of rules that is basically uh, that, although uh, John's going to be reading a, a little bit of uh, species preference, uh, that basically that anything that's within the size of the gape of the predator can be consumed. And so it gives you a contrasting hypothesis for what those diet matrices will look like. And that becomes important when you're trying to link into some of these lower trophic uh, forage species, for example, that, that do go up and down in abundance quite a bit year to year and could really drive changes. So I think that we, we wanted to set it up in order to set up that contrast and to test those assumptions of model uh, parameterization. Great, Isaac, thanks, and Kristen, thanks for your answer. Um, 
So I'm not seeing any more questions. Unless there's one. Oh, yes. Dave has another question. Sorry, I dragged this out. Um, it was for Charlie. I didn't. Um, early on, uh, um, you presented some uh, Chesapeake Bay and Northeast Shelf examples, and, uh, and then we saw great examples in the Northwest Pacific and um, Bering Sea. And you think there's more um, low hanging fruit for uh, opportunities to do this kind of work in Southeast Atlantic? or Gulf of Mexico or Southern Pacific, uh, the data and resources there in terms of what you're aware of or people you've talked to, or um, the kind of the kind of what can be done uh, in the regions that are currently have this kind of information? Um, no, I certainly think that the, the efforts can be extended to other regions. I know that you know, in the Gulf of Mexico and um, Southeast, uh, there's been some work at AOML, and actually the the um, domain that we're using for the Northeast U.S. COCA project actually includes the entire uh, Gulf of Mexico and Southeast U.S. shelf as well. It, 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 um, you know, it just proved uh, tractable to, to only do that really quite large domain. So I think that there's a potential um, benefit there uh, across regions. Uh, the South, uh, did you mention the South Pacific? Uh, so I meant like Southern California current. Oh, okay, got, got you. Um, um, so I know the, uh, um, the domain that we're using out in California and the one that the uh, Santa Cruz folks are also using covers quite a bit of, um, you know, kind of, kind of extends down to the Baja Peninsula. Uh, and. And yeah, so I think uh, the existing projects would cover parts of that, and of course, uh, creating a regional model is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a doable problem. It's not, I wouldn't call it easy by any means, but it's, um, it's a doable thing uh, to get one in kind of up and running in proof of concept mode. I think the challenge is kind of getting to the levels that, that both Kirsten and, and Isaac were talking about, where you've gone from proof of concept to something that starts to inform um, Strategic and perhaps tactical management decisions, and, and that the, the bar that these systems have to get over, I think, to be able to do that is um, well, we haven't defined it clearly. I, I think it, it's a pretty rigorous bar. Um, um, so, um, proof of concept is doable. Getting into management is, is, is a heavy lift. Great, thanks. I have a question. One more question. Sorry. Uh, Charlie, this is Dan Barry. I had a question for you on one of your early slides with the CMIP-5 model results. So it, seemed like, it seemed like for the time series for net primary productivity, the two GFDL models and the, um, the NCAR, the CESM with biogeochemistry um, didn't really show much of a change in NPP, but all of the other models had kind of a crash, global crash in NPP. And I was just wondering why that is. I mean, it seems like the more sophisticated models that have BGC in them were not really agreeing with perhaps the, the just more coupled climate models that maybe don't have as advanced uh, biogeochem. Um, so, so all of them were, were coupled models. Uh, they do have a range of complexities in their, in their ecology. Um, I think it, within the existing uncertainty in the ecosystem formulation, it's, it's possible to get global values that either stay stable or decline by about, you know, 10, 10 to 20 percent. Uh, so that, but the crash was really only about 10 or 20 percent in the in the global mean, um, and and we're still uh, as a community trying to um, reduce that uncertainty and, and things like the temperature dependence of particle remineralization become very important to the direction of that sign. The, um, the more important thing though is, well, well NPP remains uncertain uh, because uh, the, the ecosystem can compensate by recycling more nutrients. Uh, the things that drive fisheries yield, like uh, mesozooplankton and the export of detritus to the benthos are actually, the, the models more robustly agree that those will go down uh, in the future. And, and that's because they're mostly more, more closely linked to the fact that at, at some level, um, 
everything's dictated by how many nutrients get into the euphotic zone. If that decreases due to increasing stratification, there's only so much what they call export production that one can create. So you can change the amount of primary production by recycling more, but you really can't change the amount of export production. So um, the, the NPP uncertainty is still there, but I'm not sure it's the most relevant quantity. And in, in the most relevant quantity, there's more agreement. Hmm. Okay. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, on that note, I think we will wrap up. Uh, I want to thank Roger very much for his help organizing and scoping this webinar. I don't know, Roger, if you wanted to say anything, but... Um, I think you did all the work, so thank you. <laughs> no, <Jeff>. that's not <laughs> true. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, just as a reminder, the full recording of this webinar is going to be posted to our website shortly, so you can access it there, and I'll also post the PDFs of the presentation and I'll uh, send out an email about that once that's up. So I want to thank the three speakers again for really excellent presentations today, and I uh, look forward to seeing you all next month. Uh, stay tuned for the announcement about our next month's webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>